Thank you, Philippa. Um, okay, so this paper incorporates work from two of my PhD chapters, and it will look at the impact of the introduction of conscription in 1916 had on press representations of anti-war men and women in Britain. And in particular, it will consider the effect that conscription had on gendered perceptions of war resistance. Conscription is particularly significant for the anti-war movement because it introduces the conscientious objector, or CO, into British wartime society for the first time. And the attention that the CO garnered as both a figure of derision and of admiration changed the way that the anti-war movement was depicted by those who were adamantly against their position as well as having significant implications for the way that the anti-war movement represented itself. <coughs> In order to demonstrate the way that conscription altered representations of the movement, I'm going to first give some examples from 1914 and 1915 to highlight its self-representation in the early years of the conflict, and then moving into 1916, where the CO really dominates the press representations of resistance, I'll consider some of the key themes that we use to, to depict COs. Finally, I'll be reflecting on what implications the focus on objectors and the ways that, ways that they were represented had on the self-perception of the anti-war movement in 1916, and will in particular pay attention to the way that some of the dominant anti-war discourses from the first two years of the war changed as a response to this. So this paper is going to focus primarily on the anti-war press, as it is in the anti-war movement's self-representation that conscription had the most visible impact. I'll be drawing on examples from the two main pacifist papers of the period, the Herald and the Labour Leader, as well as the Manchester Guardian, who whilst generally in support of the war effort, supported the stance and rights of COs and sympathetically reported on anti-war activity. The articles and letters written by those who opposed the conflict provide significant insight into how war resistors perceived themselves and frame their opposition to war and by looking at the press chronologically, we can also see how the anti-war movement responded to events and developments in the war. So in the years 1914 and 15, the press attention on opposition to the war was generally focused on the activities of women. Indeed, women are positioned as a very distinct group in the anti-war movement, and female opponents of the war write diverse and varied articles and letters outlining anti-war positions that make very specific references to their gender. In contrast, men do not appear as a specific part of the anti-war movement, and instead their activities are subsumed into general reporting about the peace movement as a whole. Whilst women's opposition to the war is elaborated upon in many articles that associate femininity with peace, there is an absence of any discussion about the particular position of men within the peace movement. What comes across, across very clearly in almost all of the representations of anti-war women is that gender was central to the way that these women were both conceived by others and represented themselves. So by looking at how women both frame their opposition to war, as well as looking at the reporting on the most significant attempt to establish peace in the early years of the war, the International Women's Peace Congress at The Hague in 1915, the self-conceptualization of the anti-war movement prior to conscription can be illuminated. A substantial number of articles that consider women's particular opposition to war are based on specific assumptions concerning the relationship between women and peace, which is often associated directly with motherhood. As Margaret Higginay has argued, the rhetoric of motherhood was often underscored by a belief that men were naturally fierce and warlike, whilst women as mothers had an affinity for peace. The belief that women held particular nurturing and pacifistic qualities because of their ability to become mothers underpinned many of the representations of anti-war women in this early period of the war. However, the associations between the qualities of motherhood and peace were used by women in varied ways and with different intentions. Significantly, whilst drawing upon conventional constructions of a passive and nurturing womanhood could reinforce accepted feminine stereotypes the manner and purpose in which women linked this to their opposition to war did not necessarily always equate to a reinforcement of normative ideals of femininity. Two articles which illustrate how anti-war women use narratives of motherhood and caregiving to outline an opposition to war are written by Lucy Toomeyan and Nora O'Shea. So Lucy Toomeyan's article, which appears in the Herald shortly after the beginning of the war, 
contends that the role that women should play in ensuring a swift end to the conflict and the prevention of further wars is direct, directly linked to qualities that are assumed to be common to all women. Appealing for women to work for peace as mothers of humanity and sisters of the whole human race, Tumayan argues that working for peace is a role that is very specifically suited to the strong <coughs> influence of women. Consequently, she connects women's responsibility to work for peace directly to what she perceives as qualities that are natural to women rather than any individual specific belief or attitude. She bolsters this contention by saying that those women who will work for peace will do so as true women and thus suggests that women who oppose the war are actually fulfilling their natural feminine role. As such, Tumayam directly links women's opposition to the war with perceived inherently feminine pacifistic qualities. Moreover, she indicates a belief that by embracing a loving and nurturing femininity based on their roles as mothers, women are fulfilling their feminine role in the war by opposing the conflict and working towards peace. Anti-war women also use the perceived innate maternal and loving qualities of women to assign themselves special responsibility in the political sphere. In this way, invoking these particular feminine qualities were a way of enabling some women to push for a more radical peace agenda in terms of the, the role that women would play in the peacemaking process. Nora O'Shea's article, The Duty of Women, is one such piece which uses these conventional feminine qualities to argue that women have a responsibility to enter into the international political sphere and identify and subsequently prevent the causes of war. O'Shea asks, upon whom devolves the duty of calling upon the warring nations to cease fire and demanding that this useless sacrifice of life shall stop? To that question, I can find one answer, upon the women, the givers and protectors of life. Again, women's, women's role as mothers is pinpointed as the reason behind their responsibility to work for peace. However, O'Shea goes on to use this particular duty to criticise women's response to the war thus far and challenges the traditionally passive role that women have played during war. She asks, has it nothing more to give the world than the old time-honoured methods of soups and blankets up to date? Has it too, like its charitable forebear, decided to be content to deal with effects and is the task of dealing with causes to be left to us as a task beyond its power? Drawing on an argument that with pati women's particular qualities comes particular responsibilities, O'Shea suggests that if the women of non-combatant nations want to save the women of other nations from the horrors of war and the waste of life, then it is for them to move and move quickly. So by suggesting that women should play a role not only in alleviating the effects of war, but also in analysing and preventing the very foundations upon which conflict arises, O'Shea argues for women to play an important political role in the peacemaking process. O'Shea uses a conventional construction of maternal femininity to illustrate women's unique, unique and significant responsibilities. However, she pushes this out of the traditional confines of the women's sphere and instead argues that women, women's unique qualities as mothers and caregivers provide them with the equipment to effectively address and resolve the political and social causes of war. The perceived connections between women and peace that are emphasised in Tumayan's and O'Shea's articles similarly infused the reporting of the Women's Peace Congress at The Hague in 1915, which brought women together from over 12 different countries to discuss the possibility of a swift and permanent peace. For example, an article appearing in The Labour Leader, written by its editor Fenner Brockway, states that among women, the most remarkable movement of all is proceeding. Across the frontier, the cry of a common sisterhood is heard. It is the cry of an awakened womanhood, determined to bring an early peace, determined that the peace should be lasting. The contention that the organisation of the Congress is an embodiment of awakened womanhood echoes Tumayan's suggestion of anti-war women being true women and is illustrative of an understanding of women's peace activism as a fulfilment of their role as women and consequently implies that the actions of anti-war women are based primarily on their gender. The Herald also comments on the Congress, noting not only that women have a deep interest in the conditions of peace, but also marking these women out as pioneers. In suggesting that there is a natural association between women 
Peace, the anti-war press represents the organisation of the Women's Peace Conference as an instinctive expression of women's inherent characteristics and interests. Statements by women who are in support of or are actively involved with the Congress also write in the press invoking the narratives associating women in opposition to war. The Herald, for instance, prints a statement issued by the British Committee of the International Women's Congress in its paper from 3rd of April 1915. This statement similarly highlights women's status as non-combatants and caregivers in relation to their particular participation in the Congress. They write... Ever since the outbreak of war, the question has been repeatedly asked, what are the women going to do? It is much more difficult for men to meet up in conference. They are in the silent armies. Women as non-combatants have this right, and as guardians of, of the race, they have the duty. This statement not only makes it clear that organising for peace is held to be the duty and responsibility of women, but also points to how these gendered connotations of peace and war have significant implications for male war resistance. In fact, in drawing out the distinctions between women as non-combatants and men as combatants, this statement reinforces the gendered division of wartime activity. In doing so, it, it points to the potentially limiting effect that gendered narratives of peace and combat <coughs> have on men and women's ability to openly resist the war. So as these examples hopefully demonstrate, the links between peace and women were not only supported, but also bolstered by the anti-war press prior to conscription. Opposing the war was seen to be the duty and responsibility of women, something that as women they were naturally inclined to do. The women who gathered together at The Hague were represented as pioneers who demonstrated an awakened, fulfilled motherhood. Womanhood, sorry. Indeed, to some extent, the <coughs> representation of the anti-war movement can be characterised as feminine. However, from the end of May 1915, debates about the possibility, possibility of introducing conscription gained momentum and became one of the key issues for the remainder of 1915. This was certainly reflected in the anti-war press, and a small number of articles began to consider those men who would openly resist conscription. The most striking of these appeared in the leader in June under the title An Open Letter to Advocates of Conscription Written by a Young Man of Military Age. In this letter, one of the themes that would come to dominate representations of objectors from 1916 is used to frame the narrative, the theme of sacrifice. The text states, for example, that these young men, while ready to face every danger and sacrifice in the cause of their country, their ideals must conscientiously refuse to have any avoidable share in the killing of their fellow men or in the preparation, therefore. Broader ideas about sacrificing for the nation are also linked to more personal ideas about self-sacrifice, with the writer arguing, I have always striven to interpret my life in an unselfish way in relation to my fellow men and my country, and I have never shrunk from personal sacrifice for the common good. The emphasis placed on sacrifice in this text reveals how male war resistors attempted to frame their resistance within a code of sacrifice that had come to take on particular significance in the war, especially in relation to men of military age. In emphasising sacrifice, this text illustrates how this <coughs> particular ideal was perceived as distinctively, distinctly significant for men because of the role they were required to perform in warfare. By establishing his opposition within a framework of sacrifice, the author engages in an attempt to position objectors on the same footing as men who have volunteered for military service, and thus to a distinctly wartime masculine framework of opposition. Indeed, the author engages in an implicit attempt to align objectors with volunteers. He writes, I honour those who, feeling that duty called them to this distasteful work, have given up everything to serve their country in this way. I think they are mistaken and misguided in their act, but entirely right in their motive. Each man must judge in such a serious manner for himself. Thus the objector implicitly suggests that he is the embodiment of war resistance, in much the same way as the volunteer is conceived as the embodiment of the patriotic spirit. As Lois Bibbings has argued, supporters of objectors contended that the brave CO, like the exemplary volunteer, was acting upon his conscience and doing his duty by following his beliefs. 
the positioning of the CEO on a level with the volunteer and in terms of sacrifice has significant implications for the self-representation of the anti-war movement and the effect of these new narratives of war resistance become particularly evident following the introduction of mili military conscription in January 1916. Conscription and the legal enshrinement of conscientious objection in the Military Service Acts of 1916 heralded a change in British wartime society, which had direct repercussions for the way that war resistors were perceived, both by those who sympathised with them and those who res resolutely disagreed with any anti-war position. A vociferous and often vicious public campaign against war resistors and conscientious objectors in particular conducted primarily by the pro-war press gained momentum. Yet the introduction of conscription and the subsequent publicity it gave to the anti-war community also worked to the advantage of war resistors. The public attention on CEOs gave the anti-war movement renewed impetus, a constant stream of news and a specific focus. As Cyril Pierce has argued, conscription gave the war's opponents their own flesh and blood conflict. And indeed from 1916, it was not women was objectors who became the main focus of the anti-war press. So what were the key narratives used in depictions of objectors? As we've already seen, sacrifice was a central discourse, and alongside this were, were the themes of courage and bravery, and all three of these were linked to questions of masculinity. The way that each of these themes was framed in relation to conscientious objectors had a direct impact on the self-representation of the anti-war movement as a whole, and specifically on the positioning of men and women within the movement. <coughs> <coughs> the enlistment of men into military service was intimately intertwined with ideas about men's willingness to sacrifice and perform their masculine duty to the nation. As such, those men who actively refused to take part in combatant activity were perceived as lazy, cowardly, and selfish. Representations of volunteers and soldiering were central in promoting enlistment as the embodiment of the ultimate sacrifice and duty to the nation, and played a significant role in creating both a specific depiction of the soldier and both those men who did not enlist. In an environment in which sacrifice and duty were unmistakably portrayed as being connected to active war service, men who made a public refusal to take part in the war were castigated in terms that made specific reference to sacrifice. Whilst acknowledging that objectors could ultimately not sacrifice to the same extent that soldiers did, the anti-war press did not, however, shy away from depicting CEOs in terms of their sacrifice. In fact, it became central to the consideration of, of objectors, and certain aspects of CEOs' experiences benefited these representations. The imprisonment and harsh conditions that CEOs often face played the most consistent role in depictions of sacrifice, and in many ways their suffering gave unprecedented publicity to opponents of the war. The harsh treatment that objectors received became a marker of how CEOs were suffering for their convictions, and indeed much of the representations relating to sacrifice highlighted the willingness of CEOs to, su to suffer for their cause. For example, a letter from John Clifford to the Manchester Guardian is illustrative of the way that objectors' suffering was couched in terms of their strength and sincerity of belief. He writes, Now these men are prepared to suffer. They expect it. They do not mind. They have character. They know they are in daily peril of their lives, but they do not fear death. They elect to be shot because they cannot and dare not kill others. They are strong and ready to pay the price of their loyalty to God and man. Clifford shows how objectors have taken their position in the knowledge that they will suffer and possibly die, and emphasises their willingness to sacrifice for their stance. This expectation of physical suffering is also connected to their masculinity and position as men. The conflation between the objectors' stance with suffering and even death has parallels with Joanna Burke's contention that the potential mutilation of the male body lies at the heart of ideologies of masculinity and that men who refused to, or were incapable of fighting, were not deemed to be worthy of active membership in the wider body politic. So in portraying CEOs as expectant and willing to face physical suffering and death, this letter also attempts to engage objectors as a worthy masculine figure. Sacrificing for their stance is not only presented as something that CEOs are willing to do, but is also often portrayed as a privilege endowed upon the objector. <coughs> 
The Herald, for example, prints a letter from a conscientious objector named E.A. Oliver, who writes that as a CO, he counts it as a privilege to suffer for his convictions, if by so doing he can rid the world of what the soldiers themselves describe as hell. The assertion that suffering is a privilege for objectors is illustrative of the view that direct suffering, and particularly suffering of the body, is linked to a hierarchy within wartime society. The identification of sacrifice as a source of opportunity and the link that it makes to soldiers suggests that because of their sacrifice, objectors are able to position themselves as leaders of the resistance to war because their <coughs> suffering will have more of an impact than those who do not directly or physically suffer for their opposition. The way that this sacrifice is framed around CEOs in terms of both the privilege and broader purpose and impact engenders the positioning of CEOs at the top of the hierarchy of war resistors precisely because of their position to make some sort of physical sacrifice, just as the soldier does. This in turn demonstrates how the interplay of masculinity and sacrifice is as relevant for the representation of the anti-war movement in 1916 as it is for the war effort. <coughs> And in September 1916, the willingness to die for the stance of a CO became a concrete reality with the death of Walter Roberts, which, as Thomas Kennedy notes, gave the CO movement its first authentic martyr. The anti-war press acted accordingly, framing the death of Roberts as evidence that COs were willing to perform the ultimate sacrifice and die for their cause. The Herald reports on the death of Roberts by saying, he is the first of the CEOs to go under and has literally died for England as any other man in the war. The CEOs who give up freedom and even life itself and the men who go out to war in search of the Holy Grail are all members of the one great army which will redeem the world by proving it is service, not selfishness, which exalts the nation. What is particularly significant in this text is the argument that with the death of Roberts, CEOs have been raised to a position akin to the soldier and consequently contend that their selfless sacrifice for the benefit of the nation must be acknowledged. Furthermore, in connecting the sacrifice of CEOs and soldiers, the text taps into the discourses of bravery, heroism and patriotism that were directly associated with soldiers. This type of representation seeks not only to elevate objectives to the position of the soldier, but also highlights just how important important this notion of male physical sacrifice was to representing male war resistors. So connected to this theme of sacrifice is that of courage, and in terms of gender it was in the consideration of courage that masculinity was most explicitly invoked. As Graham Dawson argues, Military virtues such as strength, courage, and endurance have repeatedly been defined as the natural inher and inherent qualities of manhood, with the soldier taking position as the quintessential figure of masculinity. This explicitly gendered configuration of the soldier had significant implications for the way that men who chose not to participate in combat and activity were considered. As masculine identity became a tool with which si society induced men to fight, those men who not only avoided this, but made a public refusal to do so, were seen as unmanly cowards. The anti-war press engaged in an attempt to counter narratives of cowardice and unmanliness by emphasising the, mor the moral courage required of CEOs to go against the majority of public opinion. The Herald outlined this type of courage explicitly in one of its articles on objectors, stating that it is easy enough to sneer at the conscientious objector to call people with whom you do not agree cowards and shirkers. As a matter of fact, especially in time of war, it requires considerable courage to differ from the mass of the people. To face persecution, imprisonment, and contumely for a principle is not the way which cowards and shirkers choose. By highlighting moral courage, the Herald subverts the definition of courage that places physical sacrifice and activity at the center. In doing so, the article emphasises the morality of the motivations of objectors, whilst using the fact that CEOs are going against public opinion and thus suffering for their views to demonstrate the sincerity of their convictions and their courage in taking such an unpopular stance. The emphasis on moral courage rather than physical courage also permitted su supporters of CEOs to suggest that objectors are in fact more courageous than soldiers. <coughs> 
As one reader of the Manchester Guardian suggests, the idea that the conscientious objector must be a coward is a grotesque delusion, seeing that the moral courage demanded of him in confessing to so unpopular an eccentricity must in the present state of public opinion be far greater than that required for even voluntary enlistment for the dangers of the front. The comparisons made between the moral courage of soldiers and moral courage of objectors demonstrates how the reconfiguration of courage to a concept based on morality and going against the grain enables CO supporters to suggest that objectors are demonstrating the most courage. This move away from the male body as the basis of courage is particularly instructive in revealing how wartime masculinity was constructed and how representations of COs implicitly attempted to subvert this. As David Morgan argues, the association between masculinity and male combat activity is a particularly entrenched gender construction, with the ima image of the warrior continuing to be a key symbol of masculinity. Within this context, the emphasis on moral courage in the anti-war press represents the challenge to militarised forms of masculinity, which emphasise the male body as the main site for the display of courage. The limitations that supporters of objectors faced positioning CO's masculinity with reference to their bodies could thus be somewhat circumvented in emphasising the moral aspect in objectors' stance. The associations and comparisons between soldiers and COs also took another form in regards to the representation of courage and involved the anti-war press invoking the language of militarism in order to demonstrate the courage of objectors. One example that illustrates both the comparison between soldiers and COs and militaristic imagery can be found in a poem by Carol Ring published in the Labour Leader in July 1916, in which COs are described as going out for battle but without the large public support and approval that soldiers have. They have gone out to battle, uncommended, no ringing cheers and women's proud tears, for them cold disapproval, friends offended and the world sneers. The use of military imagery is particularly interesting and in it demonstrates how pervasive the connection between courage, masculinity and combat was. Consequently, a complex, complex discourse in which moral courage, removed from the sight of the male body, is placed in the context, context of combat imagery, emerges in some representations of the courage and manliness of COs. This type of representation reveals how the anti-war press struggled in its attempts to portray objectors as both manly and opposed to war, and in turn reveals the dilemma that the anti-war press faced, either to engage with the discourse of militarism and manliness, or to attempt to reformulate masculinity by subverting or redefining the qualities so closely connected to soldiering. The combination of both reveals how the anti-war press engaged in an attempt to redefine masculinity through an interweaving of redefined terms of manliness, such as opposition to war and moral courage, with more traditional conceptions of the link between men and combat. The need to reconfigure the understanding of masculinity in representations highlights how gender norms regarding masculinity, femini femininity, war and peace meant that whilst anti-war women could readily draw upon established and accepted narratives of femininity and peace, Anti-war men had to actively challenge the wartime constructions of masculinity in order to assert both their manliness and their opposition to the war. Moreover, in presenting a direct challenge to the construction of military masculinity in both their act and their representation, the figure of the CEO is illustrative of Anna Card and Coyne's assertion that gender in wartime is not secured or fixed, it is often unstable, flexible, anxious and uncertain. Indeed, the implicit attempts to redefine the manliness of objectors by the anti-war press highlight the instability of this gender construction during the war. So how did these representations of objectors impact upon the way that anti-war women were represented? If we return to the theme of motherhood, then the change in representations of anti-war women becomes most obvious. Motherhood remains a prominent theme throughout 1916 in representations of anti-war women, However, the focus of these representations changes as a direct response to the introduction of the conscientious objector. The articulation of an anti-war stance based on the perceived qualities that motherhood engenders develops into an expression of motherhood based directly on conscientious objectors. 
Consequently, the motherhood rhetoric changes from being a narrative centred on the qualities specific to women and the subsequent influence this is perceived to hold on women's natural desire for peace, <coughs> and instead shifts to a narrative that is based almost entirely on a relationship with male war resistors. Whilst the anti-war movement was not necessarily a movement completely defined and operated by women, it is evident from the examination of 1914 and 1915 that peace and femininity were inextricably intertwined. Thus the introduction of high-profile male war resistors into the generally feminised representation of the anti-war movement can reveal not only the relationship between peace and gender, but also the gender hierarchies at play within the anti-war movement. The first reference to the mother of the objector in the anti-war press comes in an image titled Mother of the First Conscientious Objector, printed in the Herald in March and the rest of 1915. This image, depicting Mary at the foot of Jesus' cross, emphasises not only the connections that are repeatedly made between objectors and Jesus, but also highlights in the importance of maternal sacrifice in representations of COs. Similarly, the connection between mothers of objectors and Mary is also invoked in a letter printed in the Labour leader from a mother of one of the COs who was sent to France under the threat of the death penalty. She writes, I am well nigh broken hearted, but in my grief I am proud to be the mother of such a man, having in my mind Mary, the mother of the first conscientious objector. Christ remained true to his mission, on earth peace. <coughs> my son has been true to his principles also. Though faced with death and imprisonment, he has never wavered, following in the footsteps of the lowly carpenter. That the focus of this image is on the mother rather than on the objector is illustrative of the broader shift in development of the motherhood narrative in 1916. Whilst the focus of motherhood in earlier years of the war was based on the qualities of peace and love associated with it, the introduction of the CO engenders a shift towards motherhood as a proxy sacrifice. The ultimate sacrifice for peace made by the objector, a sacrifice that cannot be made by women by virtue of their omission from compulsory military service, thus pushes women's connection to peace from one of natural inherent qualities to one regulated through the action of her son. Consequently, the beginning of a renegotiation of the relationship between peace and gender starts to appear from 1916. The direct relationship between peace and femininity that is so pervasive in 1950 begins to be mediated through the objector. The parallel shifts in representations of male and female war resistors, in which male war resistors, by virtue of their sacrifice and courage, are positioned as leaders, and female war resistors have subsequently moved into an almost entirely supportive position, demonstrates how the introduction of conscription engendered a change in the self-representation of the anti-war movement. That this change is directly linked to the positioning of men and women in the movement highlights the significant role that gender played in the way war resistors represented themselves. Indeed, the moves to place women into a position that meant that their connection to peace and war resistance was mediated through the CO demonstrates how the anti-war press attempted to, to disrupt the traditional association of women and peace activism that they themselves had to some extent propagated in the years prior to conscription. The association between women and CEOs extended beyond representations of mothers and also included wives. A number of poems and articles appearing in the Herald urged these female family members in particular to support their men. A poem by Monica Ewer, for example, describes the hardships faced by CEOs and their families addressing the support that wives have for their CEO husbands and urging both to remain strong. Though we seem so helpless quite, yet we won't give up the fight, but we'll keep your faith alight and we'll teach your kiddies right, so see it through. This appeal to anti-war women to persevere and show solidarity with their anti-war menfolk is a new theme in the anti-war press. Indeed, that this type of rhetoric appears only after the introduction of the objector is evocative of how the anti-war press shifts the representation of war resistors to be framed around the importance of the CO. So to conclude then, 1916 was a pivotal year for the representations of war resistors in the press. The presence of anti-war women both declined and changed in reaction to the introduction of conscription and the conscientious objector. In contrast to 1914 and 1915, 
And in a move that clearly highlights the impact and significance of gender on the representations of war resistors, depictions of women generally retreat to show anti-war women in relation to men, more specifically to the CO. Instead of invoking the rhetoric of motherhood for the purpose of outlining their own personal stance, from 1916, motherhood is used specifically in reference to objectors, and thus the previously direct gendered relationship between women and peace activism becomes mediated through the male war resistor. The dominance of representations of objectors in the anti-war press in particular, and the engagement with narratives of masculinity and war, demonstrate how hard the anti-war press had to work to stake a claim for war resistance within a masculine sphere. The struggle was not only because of the pro-war press's persistent ridiculing of objectors, but was also partly down to the focus on representations of peace activism as being a naturally feminine task in the early years of the war in anti-war publications. In order to overcome the latter association between women and peace, anti-war newspapers tended towards a complete disregard for this type of representation in 1916, and instead positioned CEOs as leaders of the peace movement and consequently gendered the peace movement along the same gender hierarchy as those actively engaged in the war.